The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? And welcome to this edition of Where Did The Road Go? I am your host, Soraya. And uh, tonight we have a pre-recorded interview I did just earlier today with Roy Davies out of the UK. He's the author of a book called The Darwin Conspiracy, and I absolutely loved this book. I was made aware of Roy from Skeptico, the Skeptico podcast, and I thank Alex for that because uh, the book is fantastic. Now, the thing about this book is it is completely unavailable uh, unless you want to pay a fortune for it on Amazon. They sell for about 80 bucks or so on Amazon last time I looked. But Roy has a bunch of them, and he is willing to sell them at the, the initial book cost, which I don't know what it translates to exactly in pounds. It's not a lot. It's a very fair price for the book. So if you want a copy of the book, your best bet is to contact Roy. And he has a very simple email. It's Troy Davies, T-R-O-Y-D-A-V-I-E-S, at AOL.com. And his name is Roy Davies, but apparently he has the name Troy Davies on AOL. So if you write him, he will get you, uh, he will work out getting you a copy of the book if you would like to read it. I highly recommend it. And uh, if you'd like it in ebook form, let him know or let me know, and maybe we'll do something about making that available to everybody. Just depends on whether or not there's enough of a demand to. Uh, to make it worth it. But I think everyone who is interested in science and uh, fairness, really, should read this book, The Darwin Conspiracy. There are a few on Amazon called The Darwin Conspiracy, but this is the only one about the subject you're going to hear about tonight. Also, I'd like to thank everyone who's been sharing personal stories on the Facebook page. Uh, I find them fascinating, and I might contact some of you about coming on and doing a... Uh, a short little talk about those stories and what's happened to you. And uh, I thank everyone who's given us any donations. Donations are always welcome. They help out a lot. And we have a lot of fun stuff and interesting stuff planned for the near future. So without any further ado, this is my interview with Roy Davies. All right, so how are you doing tonight, Roy? I'm very well, thank you. All right, and uh, you have written a fantastic book here with the Darwin Conspiracy, Origins of a Scientific Crime. And personally, I'd never known a lot about Darwin. I mean, I understood the theory of evolution. I never looked that deeply into Darwin. Um, what I had heard you know, throughout the years is that Darwin may not have actually been the guy who came up with the theory, and it might have been Wallace. Uh, but I never really investigated. I never looked deeper into it. And the way you've written this book, I mean, it... it reads really well on top of being a fascinating subject you've written it so you really get to know these people as you read the book thank you um and it's it's fascinating to see the process you go through fleshing out what really happened as this theory was coming together for all these different people mm -hmm. and how wallace seems to have gotten there first um yes um, that is the essence of the book. It, it, needed, it needed the context um, um, spelled out um, in order that people wouldn't be left foundering and wondering what had happened before or, or, or since. And it just seemed to me that the, um, the way the book should be written had to have um, an outline of the theoretical ideas as well as the people involved, because um, the people involved, of course, are honest people and deceptive people, and um, yeah. and that makes it a very human book, um, showing the dark side and the lighter side of the way that people think and go about their business. Now, what we, uh, what have you, uh, how can I phrase this? Well, I want to tell people a little bit about your history mm -hmm. and how you start started getting into investigating Darwin. Um, well, um, it's it's quite a simple thing. My my history um, at the beginning was as a journalist um, on, a, on newspapers, and then I went to college, and then I came out and I joined the BBC, and slowly, slowly became um, a producer in history programmes, and eventually ran the history unit at the BBC in London. And um, 
and I had several producers, and they used to come with me with ideas, or I'd come with, to them with ideas and offer them stories to do. And this was for a 50-minute uh, documentary monthly um, called uh, Chronicle. And, um, and then Time Watch, which was another series of the same name. And during the Time Watch time, uh, one of my producers came to me and said, look, there's a new book to be published soon on uh, Darwin. And um, we could do a program. I knew nothing about Darwin pretty well as you did. I mean, I, I, I had no instinct for Darwin at all, except the, the theory of evolution. Uh, and, um, and so I said, okay, well, okay, give me a rundown of what it's about, and I'll, um, I'll see it. And he gave me a rundown. It was a good uh, rundown. And I said, okay, let's have a go at it. And we'll, we'll start researching and see what comes up. And uh, about six months later, we put out the program, uh, which was called something like um, The Devil's Disciple or something. And... Um, and Dar it was about Darwin and the theory of evolution. And Wallace, um, in that story, had uh, was peripheral. Um, he sent a letter uh, to Darwin, and Darwin rushed to publish. And that became the story. But um, when uh, when I finished when I finished the program and moved on from the BBC, um, a woman came up to me and said, "You know, you told the wrong story." I said, no, 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 I never told the wrong story. It's Darwin. Everybody knows it. She said, no, you're wrong. She said, and if you read this book, you find out why you're wrong. And she gave me a, a book by a man called uh, Brackman. And this fellow had gone into this story, and he'd written such a terrific book about um, the way that Darwin um, had filched, filched these ideas from uh, Wallace and that I started researching it myself. And as a result of that, um, some six years eight, ten years later, um, I had enough research to write the book. Okay, and this was published in 2008? It was indeed, yes. Okay, and uh, you said the only other book you've written is on submarines. I, I wrote, um, we, we made a, one of the series I made when I was at the BBC was called um, uh, um, Submarines, and it was, it was a story of the development of the submarine from the earliest days um, to the Russian-American um, uh, uh, context in the um, in, well up to the present day then which was uh, 20 years ago and um, mm. and that f didn't follow the series but it gave background to um, any reader on exactly where submarines had been and, and how they got there and how they were developed uh, especially this the atomic world story was a great story between um, Russia and America um, uh, great great story mm. anyway okay. um, the, the book that book is no longer in publication I think that's been um, been chopped up and uh, is now sort of somewhere, but I mean, um, uh, that's a shame, but I mean, uh, it's never going to be republished. The BBC has given up on books. Really? Mm. Oh. Um, and, and you had some connection to Thor Heyerdahl. I too, did. Um, Thor Heyerdahl, um, when he made his last, no, not his last, but his second from last uh, voyage um, on the Tigris uh, and the Euphrates rivers, called his boat the Tigris, and it was a reed boat built in, in the Euphrates River long before the war um, in Iraq. And um, and I got involved when uh, Heyerdahl had taken his boat um, across the Indian Ocean um, to uh, Pakistan, um, but then found on the way back uh, that nobody wanted him to call in. Um, it was a very difficult time, and um, it looked for a time as if he could get into um, several countries, but he couldn't. They all said no. And in the end, he had to burn his boat um, in the Red Sea, and, um, and I was the producer at the time um, for that happening. And um, I, I wasn't producer of the entire show because that was my boss, Bruce Norman, but I was there uh, with Tor Heidel on the last voyage when he burned the boat. And um, that was quite a significant and poignant moment, actually, because he thought that might be his last voyage of all. Um, I don't think it was the last voyage, but I do think that he then went exploring the pyramids in uh, South America um, and trying to find out how they might have been connected with the pyramids in Egypt. Um, and I wasn't involved in that, um, but um, we got on very well. It was a, an interesting and um, uh, an enjoyable time. Yeah. Nice, nice. Okay, uh, now you're not, obviously this woman brought you a book. You're not the first one to doubt Darwin's uh, authorship of the theory of evolution, but it seems like you're the one who's put a lot of these pieces, these different pieces from all over the place together in one place. Um, prob probably that's true. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm no intellectual, but um, as a journalist, you, you, you smell a story and you, you look for the bits which will make it work um, and the bits that will stop it working in order that you are accurate. Um, 
And all the academics who had written about this before had taken slightly different lines, and all of them were looking for hard um, research um, which would show A or B. And um, there were about five authors before, maybe four authors before me, who had looked at Darwin, either in articles or in books, and looked at Darwin and Wallace and uh, come up with the idea that Wallace had been hard done by. But what they'd never done was to show um, in, a, in some form um, a, of narrative um, how Wallace's the ideas came and how Darwin's ideas changed as a result of Wallace sending him either, or sending the country either articles in learned magazines or direct letters to Darwin himself. And there was never a stage in the whole process whereby Darwin was... Um, uh, ahead, if you like, of Wallace in thinking. Darwin's ideas always changed once Wallace had published his latest research. And that was the most significant thing for me to find all the way through. And then to find academics like Gospovat, who actually um, had put in his book that um, Darwin's claims were wrong and um, and uh, academics hadn't seen them, um, this, this error. Um, and, but they, even then, nobody had picked it up. The book was extolled as being a very good uh, example of um, where Darwin's thinking had been, but it didn't offer Wallace as some kind of, um, uh, what we like, some kind of punching bag where his ideas came, and then Darwin um, took them and put them under his own name. And that became the most interesting part of the whole story for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh well, one of the things I found ironic is I didn't realize that Darwin was so religious. Well, indeed. I mean, that, that affects many people. Um, you know, his, his ideas were based on a, a religious concept um, for many, many years and long um, into the process whereby people thought he had long given up um, religion. It wasn't. I mean, Darwin, Darwin even in his, um, right at the very end, uh, was still uncertain about God. You just, um, you know, it's just that um, he didn't dismiss it. I mean, Wallace had never been encumbered by God. Um, he was, you know, um, a free thinker from the time that he was pretty well a five, I reckon. You know, I mean, he, he just dismissed God as, as um, a metaphysical idea, but not important. Whereas um, Darwin, and Darwin because of his wife, um, you know, um, held on to religious ideas a long time into the whole process of thinking out evolution. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it's funny that so many atheists kind of put him on a pedestal and he was a very religious man for the most of his life. Well, he was, and, and the concepts that he, he was developing as a result of his meeting with Lyle, um, who was also um, uh, uh, an interesting man, um, Darwin's religious ideas led him um, to thinking that God was the person who created new species, you know, and they could only be created, um, you know, for a particular environment. And because of that, I mean, you know, when, when Wallace started offering him ideas which are based on common sense and the idea of, um, uh, of a continuity of species as a result of an ancestor species, I mean, he couldn't accept that. He, you know, this was an anathema to his thinking. He just, it was too difficult for him to get hold of. And, um, and so he kept on arguing with uh, Hooker and with Lyle that, in fact, his ideas, um, which were based on um, a religious concept, um, uh, were right. And, of course, um, over time, both Hooker, who was a very intelligent man himself and, and, and uh, an example to us all in many ways, and Lyle, who was his great mentor, kept on saying to him, Charles, you know, you can't keep on thinking like this. You've got to change it. And, um, and, and Darwin wouldn't change um, and, um, and couldn't change because this, this whole concept of um, species change was based on um, a concept where God um, allowed certain species to be right for certain other areas of the world. You know, he didn't see it as a, a scientific project at all. He saw it as, a, as some kind of, I don't know, uh, God-enhanced theory, if you like. Um, he tried um, experiments to show that um, you could do A or B, but I mean they didn't work. It was it was um, it was startling to see the difference between um, how Wallace thought and how Darwin thought throughout um, most of the time that they were um, both researching the same thing. Uh, why don't we get into a little bit about who Charles Charles Lyell was right. and how he fit into all of this and what his theory was. Um, Lyle, um, Lyle was very important um, uh, at this time. Um, he was a geologist and, um, and believed that there 
uh, that the earth could not have been made just 6,000 years before. And he was the one who went to Italy and found that there was evidence that the earth had been turned upside down, that um, earthquakes had happened, that earth was pushed up and, and canyons had been dropped and seas had changed. And um, he came back and um, on his way back through uh, Switzerland, he called in um, to see um, Augustus de Candelay, who was a botanist, and uh, de Candelay convinced him uh, through um, botanical um, experiments as well as um, his belief system that in fact um, there, had, there had always been in nature a huge struggle for survival. Now, this was um, the same thing that uh, Malthus had come up with later, uh, had come up with himself, but de Candelay was the first person to convince Lyell that there was this huge um, conflict in nature about species trying to survive. And, um, and so um, Lyell held on to that. He was also God-related, um, but, but he, held on, he held on to that for a long time, and I think it was he who gave that concept um, from uh, from de Candelay in Switzerland to Darwin, uh, because it was Darwin who said, um, when asked uh, by Gray from Boston, he said, um, you know, my my influences, he said, are de Candelay um, uh, and um, and two other people. Uh, well, Lyell was one of them. De Candelay was one. Lyell was the other one. And a man called Herbert, uh, who was one of his correspondents, was the third. Malthus wasn't even mentioned uh, with this theory of. Um, uh, of the struggle for existence. So, uh, sorry, I, I've got out of out of storyline there, but I mean that's that's, right. that's where that's where Lyell fits in. Okay. Um, now, what what was what was Darwin's life like growing up? Privileged, um, expensive, um, uh, um, the sort of life that um, most of us don't know. Um, simply because he went to public school and he was of a very famous father and grandfather and um, and he w the full family was wealthy, um, university uh, educated um, to be a, first of all to be a, um, a, a, a churchman and then later um, when his interest obviously was not in the church uh, he tried uh, being a doctor as well and that failed. And in the end, he became a naturalist, um, which had been his understanding of the world for a long time. He would enjoyed that, along with hunting and shooting and um, uh, other pursuits um, uh, for rich kids. And um, and he wasn't um, he wasn't defeat in any sense. He was um, he was quite um, uh, an athletic person. He loved the long jump and um, cycled vast distances. Uh, he enjoyed running, and and basically um, he played fives, which is a um, um, a tennis game uh, where you don't have a racket; you have just use your hand and hit the ball with your hand. And he was uh, quite a good exponent of that. So in a way, you know, growing up, he was obviously um, he was nearly six foot tall. He was um, you know he was uh, he was interesting. He was moneyed. He was wealthy. He had important social uh, contacts, and um, and basically it must have been quite a, a hoot for Charles Darwin um, up until the age when um, when he came into conflict with uh, Wallace. Okay, now, now compared to what was what, comparing uh, Darwin to Wallace, what was Wallace's I don't life think like? You can compare the two, really. <laughs> Wallace. <laughs> I'll well, say, con say contrasting. <laughs> contrasting, connect. Yeah. Um, Wallace. Wallace was. Wallace was a, um, a boy who was growing up in a in a family which once had had some um, modest income, but now had none. And um, was born in a on a border town uh, between Wales and England called Usk, and um, and at the age of five left Wales, which Usk was then in, and um, and went to a, a town called Hurt, Hartford, H E R T Hartford, about 50 miles north of London, um, and where at the age of 14 he left school and pretty well. Um, after that became um, an assistant surveyor to his brother, who was a surveyor surveying um, land for railway development, etc. And, um, and that was the way he grew up. He had never, ever attended more than um, uh, a local elementary school. He did um, become a sort of a part-time teacher uh, in one of the schools, as they did then, once you were grown up, and he taught architecture and drawing. But basically, his, limited, his, his whole education was limited to enthusiasm that um, he found outside of any uh, formal schooling education. Okay, and I mean everyone knows about uh, 
the whole trip that Darwin took where he claims to have discovered the theory of evolution. Mm-hmm. But, but, uh, yeah. uh, Wallace was all over the world exploring at the same, you know, around, well, after that, I should say it happened a little after Darwin. Yeah. Let me, let's just deal with, um, Darwin first and, and, um, and the Beagle because, um, Darwin went on the Beagle as an assistant and, um, uh, companion to the captain. And uh, he was down as a naturalist on board. Um, and when they got to the Galapagos, having um, surveyed the whole coast of South America um, on the um, east side and then the west side, um, and they got to the Galapagos, um, Darwin had pretty well no idea of what was happening on the Galapagos Islands, no idea at all. And it was only after coming back to England that his friends helped him to put into context uh, the fact there were certain things happening on the Galapagos between the species to be found there and uh, what he'd brought back so that he was able to use it himself. But he wrote two versions of the Galapagos. In the first version of the Galapagos Islands, um, there was no mention of the Galapagos, well, the first mention of his voyage, there was no mention of the Galapagos at all. Um, you know, uh, he just um, he just passed it over as if it was just, just another place to visit. Um, interesting, but no more. Um, ten years later, um, when he's already um, read and uh, started thinking about some of the ideas of Edward Blythe and some other people, he introduced into his second version a complete understanding of the Galapagos as part of the evolution. And, and that was one of the first things which astonished me, that, um, that this had been discovered um, you know, and, um, and had not been made public. Um, in any in, in any sense um, where we could learn about it or read about it, all we got was the Galapagos was very important in Charles Darwin uh, coming to the theory of evolution, and it was right. certainly unlike that totally. Hmm. And and Wallace was spent a good deal of his life out in Southeast Asia and South America collecting different specimens and actually observing so much stuff in the wild. He did, and that. That all happened because of his um, interest in uh, nature, which started when he began this uh, surveying job. And uh, he got so interested in beetles that he suggested to one of his um, colleagues, who was also a collector, saying, look, why don't we go off to um, a place and um, find um, uh, these um, species with a view to discovering the origin of species. He actually made that clear in a letter to his uh, friend Bates. And, um, And they both went off to the Amazon uh, with the idea of catching so many species that half of them they sent home to England um, to make money, and the other half they'd use uh, for money to live on out there while building up their own collections. Um, that was fine, and he did that in South America for four years um, in uh, in the Amazon uh, basin and uh, with baits, but often without baits on their own. And um, uh, and then he had sent one consignment back to England. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, he sent one consignment back to England, but the second consignment uh, he put on board, jumped on board himself, and then um, some days out from South America, the boat um, sunk, uh, fire caught it, and all his collection went down with the boat. And uh, he eventually arrived something like 87 days later in Britain um, on another ship uh, with all his um, latest collections gone. He was quite um, phlegmatic about it, though he didn't he didn't seem to mind too much. Although he would have known of the the lock of value, but he was you know he was the sort of man who would say, okay, well let's go and let's find some more, let's uh, let's find more <laughs> examples of all this stuff. All right, and um, we should we should clear up for people that this is this is the mid 1800s, and so tectonic plate theory was not accepted, was not in existence at that point. True. Although some of the ideas were floating around. Um, the church had a had a very strong hold on the mindset of the people at the time. Yes, yes, it did, and um, and as I say, um, it had a very strong hold on the way people saw the world, saw their place in the world, uh, saw the whole question of how society was organised and accepted it. Um, and there were people who were against that. Uh, there were very few against it, but Wallace was one of them, and um, and didn't believe in any of this, and um, and refused to. Um, and and we are talking now, I suppose, somewhere about the early 1850s. 
And um, and at that time in England, particularly in England as well as other countries, but um, we can only talk about England because that's all I know. Um, we God was so important, and um, and you know it. The whole idea was um, suffocating. Uh, because everybody was told when they could work, when they couldn't work, when they could take holidays, um, when they had to go to chapel, where they had to go to church. Um, it was a stifling time, and uh, quite honestly, I don't think anybody who is free and unencumbered by those ideas today can possibly imagine what it must have been like, um, you know, to be to have to answer to the church in some way uh, for their conduct. And so, all these guys, as they were presenting these theories, even the ones who were religious, were bumping up against opposition when Lyle said, you know, the Earth's older than 6,000 years old, that was almost heresy wow. at that Wow, yes, point. indeed. I mean, that was, uh, that was something else. And, um, and it was for people like Lyle to say it because they had the position in society which could actually make it count. Um, Wallace could never have said that. When he wouldn't have been interested in it anyway because he didn't believe in religion. And, and, um, and the whole idea of how old the world was uh, was inconceivable to, um, to most of the population at that time um, simply because they, they had no high idea of, of the kind of convulsion that the Earth had gone through in terms of all these natural phenomena happening. Um, they just believed that this was how God made it and, um, and it's always been like this. You know, thank you very much. And uh, we'll exist. And, uh, you know. Okay. Um, now, Darwin didn't just take stuff from Wallace, though. He started earlier than that. Um, yeah. Because he, he had... <laughs> Or he would borrow people's theories and not credit them. Oh, so glad you said that. I didn't. I didn't quite know how to phrase it myself. But yeah, uh, the man purloined stuff, and um, <coughs> and always and always denied um, that this had been so, and never once acknowledged the names of the people um, who he was supposed to have uh, taken this stuff from. I mean, Edward Blythe was one who came up with um, a theory very, very close to evolution, but because he too uh, was ruled by the church, um, couldn't make the final step to a theory which didn't have God in it. And, uh, and Darwin coming on top of his stuff after returning from the Beagle voyage, um, within months, uh, taken um, uh, Blythe's ideas and work with them. Even the examples he uses, and they are extremely strange examples, um, uh, even the examples that uh, Blythe had used in his um, account in uh, the uh, Blackwoods magazine, the natural, um, it's, it was called the Natural History magazine in Britain, um, even those were taken by Darwin to use um, as example, his own examples of um, claiming uh, what Blythe had seen in his uh, theory. So. So in a way, um, you know, people don't want to accept this either uh, in, on either side of the Atlantic, really. I mean, they just, they just rather that Darwin was the first person ever to think of evolution, whereas, in fact, I mean, uh, you know, it's been thought of as a, as a, a process um, way back in, in Greek times, in ancient Greek times, and, um, and had been thought so until the church put a kibosh on that in the, uh, in the 17th century. So, so really... Um, it wasn't a new idea, evolution, that the people had evolved. It was just that nobody could prove it. And, um, and Darwin went mm. about his experimentations in, in an attempt to show how new populations um, inhabited islands which had just been formed by being pushed up from under the sea, which is virgin soil. Um, and well, how do, how do if, 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 um, if all species are made for the environment in which they live, what environment is a new island being pushed up from the ocean floor? Well, he had um, all sorts of new, uh, well, existing species go to these islands and, and um, inhabit them. But because they were new islands, they were a different, different place. And so Darwin's initial ideas were that these new um, uh, populated species suddenly jumped, uh, he called it per saltum, suddenly jumped into species which could live on this new island. And that's the only way that new species could come into the world. This was his idea. 
And of course, I mean, um, it was shown by Wallace um, quite soon afterwards that um, it was such a such a silly idea. Mind you, um, it wasn't only that. Lyle and Hooker had also told Darwin that his, his ideas um, weren't very good. Um, but um, that didn't come out until um, we got letters from Lyle and Hooker to Darwin when his correspondence was first um, uh, exposed in early in the century, in, in the early in the last century. And um, now, who who had the Atlantis theory? Well, um, the Atlantis theory was um, a fellow called Forbes, and uh, okay. Edwin Forbes um, had. Um, <laughs> had speculated after a, um, a, um, uh, a survey he did um, of the oceans around the British Isles that in fact there had once been um, uh, that, that the islands of the Atlantic, the, um, uh, the Madeira and, um, and the others, were off the African coast, had once been um, part of a continent um, which had sub merged into the sea after some huge um, sort of great catastrophe and left these islands um, uh, alone in in the in the south in the north atlantic opposite the coast of africa and um, and he said that um, as a result of that you could find on these islands exactly the same species as you could find on the mainland of africa which to once it had been joined but when these with the flooding took place and the floor the ocean floor dropped these islands were left with these same um, species as you could find on the uh, on the mainland, and therefore you didn't need um, any explanation of how species got to um, new islands. Um, they'd always been there. It was just that this population now was cut off from the main population, which was on the mainland, um, which had once been connected to it. That was his Atlantis and theory. Know, and we know now that, to some degree, that was true because during the last ice age. Ocean levels were about 300 feet lower, Absolutely. and a lot of that area was connected. Absolutely, but... Absolutely. and um, he he also posited that um, uh, that the uh, that there were flowers and plants on the south coast of Ireland, which um, which were only replicated on the north coast of Spain. Now, between the two, now you've got the Bay of Biscay, which is a very shallow area. Um, and um, the speculation at the time was that um, Ireland and, um, uh, and the north of Spain had once been connected and that these plants on either side, as far as Hooker was concerned, was very good evidence that in fact it had been once connected um, and the land had fallen away, um, uh, which, which is now the area of the, of the Bay of Biscay, uh, northern Spain. So um, a lot of stuff was coming out uh, because of Forbes. Um, and other scientists at the same time, um, uh, Wollaston was one of them, who said, look, there are, there are connections between the species here and the species there, uh, which um, could be answered and, and are effectively answered by the whole idea of the seafloor dropping away. And, um, and so in a way, what Darwin was trying to prove uh, was entirely wrong, because, I mean, he was trying to prove that they had gone from somewhere else to these islands, whereas, in fact, um, the Atlantis really, um suggested that, in fact, it was exactly the other way around, that lots of them had died in the, um, uh, and left some species on islands. And, and Darwin was so against that Atlantis theory, he just couldn't accept that for anything. He couldn't. Couldn't. But partly because, you see, he was running seed experiments to see where the seeds that he um, put into salt water, um, uh, say, for six weeks, whether they could survive um, the journey of being um, wind blown or wave taken to another island. And of course, he couldn't get any of that to work. I mean, his his success stories were, were so um, minimal that, in fact, I mean, you couldn't make a theory out of it that stood up. And eventually, once uh, once Wallace started coming back at him with ideas, um, he dropped the seed idea straight away. Just dropped it, and it was never referred to again. <laughs> All right, we got to take a quick break, and we'll be back with Roy Davies in a minute. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And we're talking with Roy Davies about his book, The Darwin Conspiracy, Origins of a Scientific Crime. 
And uh, so let, let's get into a little bit of the evidence you present here about what Darwin stole and uh, who he stole it from. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the people you mentioned that uh, had started to question Darwin's authorship is Cyril Dean Darlington back in 1959. Yep. And w what did he find? Um, Darlington was a Sheradian professor of, at Oxford University, and um, he looked at um, when, when documents first started to appear, um, because they didn't start to appear much until the late 40s, um, uh, 1940s, uh, when, Sherard, when um, Darlington had a look at them, uh, the evidence, um, what he discovered was that Charles Darwin came up with these theories but there was nothing in the notes um, uh, in his books or in his, um, in his writings which suggested how he had come to these theories. And there was no evidence at all, nothing at all. And, um, and uh, Darlington reckoned that, um, in fact, that there, was, um, <laughs> there was greater evidence to show the authors of some of the ancient Greek writers, that, like Homer, than there was for Darwin claiming that he had these ideas from his own research, because there was nothing in his own research which showed um, that he had gone through any process of intellectual development at all for any of these ideas. And, uh, and uh, Darlington just said, you know, um, he, what he's done is to take ideas from Lyle and Hooker and make them his own, but in fact, for himself, he's not come up with anything at all which shows how he came to think this. Yeah, yeah. and uh, what about Gruber? What did he well, Gruber, Gruber was interesting as a psychoanalyst. Psych, he, I think he was a psychologist, psychoanalyst, but he um, turned himself to Darwin. And, um, and what he found with Darwin was that um, there were all sorts of um, claims by Darwin of what he had found, where he had found it, how he had found it, uh, that didn't stand up. And Gruber reckoned that uh, what, what uh, Darwin had done was to um, act like um, some kind of um, medieval explorer with, um, uh, who would turn up on a, on a shore that he hadn't seen before and just plant a flag and say, look, this is mine because I'm here, uh, ignoring the fact that it's been home to um, some tribe or other for the, for the previous couple of thousand years. And, um, and you can imagine Spanish conquistadores doing this, well, he reckoned that um, Darwin was acting in much the same way in claiming theories that he had no right to claim, um, nor did he have evidence to justify the claim. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you have a chapter in here called The Black Box in Cambridge. Yes, it's yes. Such, a, such an ominous chapter title. What, what, what was in The Black Box? Right. Um, Philip lost to that, another American um, who was young and brilliant and looking for something to do and his tutor reckoned that what he could do if he wanted to do was to go to Cambridge in England and um, where Darwin's, where there was a black box in the archives um, which contained all of Darwin's um, notes and bits and pieces that uh, nobody had ever really gone through and it was, um, it was just sitting there. Now this was in, um, in the 70s, um, 1970s and, uh, and so he went there, took a quick look, went away again, then came back and got all the stuff and started putting it in order. And what Ospovat realized was that um, when you go through Darwin's um, uh, effects in this way, that there is no evidence whatsoever um, that allows Darwin to make the claims about um, uh, uh, some of the things that he, he said he understood perfectly uh, from the um, stuff in the box. And, um, and he, made a, he wrote a book about this. Most people accept the book um, for um, what it says wonderfully about Charles Darwin, but not many people ever refer to the fact that what he's also saying is that uh, Darwin had no idea um, about um, the process of evolution um, uh, when he claims it for himself. He had, he, there was none. The, the, pro, the idea of evolution that he had in 1840s was an entirely different idea of natural selection and evolution that is in the origin of species. And there's no indication at all of how that, story, that uh, theory changed or why it changed inside the black box, inside the basic notes of Charles Darwin's intellectual life. No. Now, so, I mean, I mean the, the, the significance of that is, um, is immense, right? Uh, it, it really means that Charles Darwin has left nothing at all, certainly not in origins, certainly not in any of the black box stuff, and certainly not in his writings, of how he came to these um, uh, questions of understanding uh, evolution. 
Now, on the other hand, you had Wallace, who had published a paper called Sarawak's Law. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, Wallace, Wallace, having gone to South America, lost his stuff in the boat, came back, and within two years um, had decided he wanted to go off collecting again. Um, and now, of course, he had in his pocket all the species that he'd worked with in South America. And, um, and so Wallace went off this time with some advice from somebody in the British Museum. He went off to the Malay Archipelago, um, which is now Indonesia. And, um, and there he started traveling about the islands, talking to people, um, looking at evidence, looking at um, uh, pieces of um, material which people have co collected themselves. And slowly, 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 Wallace realized that um, what he was looking at were, were, was a very interesting example of butterflies. And, and what, what Wallace was looking at particularly was something called Ornithoptera, which is the bird wing butterfly, which sometimes has a, a wingspan of eight and a half um, inches across. Um, it's quite um, a spectacular sight. Anyway, what he realized after some research was um, that in the northeast, uh, sorry, in the northwest, which is the island of uh, Borneo, um, the Ornithoptera that he was given there was colored green and black and um, of a particular design. And 2,000 miles to the southwest, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 miles to the southeast um, were the islands north of Australia and Australia itself, where all the Ornithoptera butterflies, the bird wing butterflies there, were a particular sort of golden or brown color. And what he worked out, um, in, no, this took him about two years to work out, was that somewhere in the middle of uh, these two islands between Borneo and Australia, there had once been, probably on the island of Celebes, um, an ancestral species of uh, Ornithoptera from which these two um, uh, varieties had sprung, and slowly as they got further and further away from the central, um, uh, central island of Celebes, the, both these had taken on entirely different colorations according to the kind of environment they were in. So the green and the black going up to the top um, left-hand corner, which is northwest, um, uh, in the afforestation area had become green and black because of shades and the, and the green of the, of the greenery there. And down in the southeast, um, what he found was the, go the golden brownie, which is much more connected with the with a rather, rather more arid um, environment that they found down there. And um, and with these, this example, he suddenly was able to say, look, um, all species, all new species have developed according to where they were found, and they are always to be found, as far as he was concerned, in an environment where they were once an ancestral species. And that became the Sarawak law. And that's one of 10 uh, points that he makes in the Sarawak law about um, timing, um, history, position, climate. Um, and it's, it, it was a fascinating document. And, um, and as a result of writing it, he wrote it in February 1855 and uh, sent it off. And it was published in England on September the 1st, 1855. Uh, as the Sarawak law, law, or a law from Sarawak. And that was the theory. All, all species uh, that exist are, um, can be found um, in areas where a, pre, um, uh, a previous similar um, species uh, could have been found or can be found. And so he was, he was very much edging toward having that, that full theory of evolution at that point. And... This was pretty much ignored, wasn't it? Oh, uh, <laughs> what happened then was a travesty. Um, it went out, it was published, and not one reply, nothing at all. And nobody ever contacted him about it. It was, um, it, it, it was almost as if it had fallen on stony ground and just been trampled. Um, and for, well, for the time afterwards, of course, he was, he was hoping that somebody would cut in touch, partly because he wanted intellectual stimulation um, for his ideas. Nothing came back. Um, none of the um, none of the gentlemen um, collectors of Britain 
um, would so much get involved with, um, uh, they, weren't collect- they were collectors, but he was out there in the field doing the field work and uh, getting his hands dirty, and that wasn't um, something that um, gentlemen, uh, natural, uh, naturalists in England wanted to get involved with, so they didn't. <laughs> and uh, his agent uh, wrote him a letter saying, uh, yeah, okay, I hear you. Um, I know you want to advise, the, but everybody suggests the best thing you can do is to keep on collecting and sending your stuff back. Um, but don't don't keep on theorizing. Not many people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's and for for you know naturalists to say, well, he's below us. He's out in the field doing actual work. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, everybody's fighting to get out there and do it. You know, <laughs> at, at that stage, it was only the working class that did it. And um, but his knowledge, of course, by this time was immense. I mean, this this was the difference. He was able to hold arguments, you know, with anybody um, about species because pr- probably he was he was the greatest thinker on species even at that time in the world. Um, nobody else, and certainly nobody in the field was doing the work he was doing or going to the places that he was going to find the examples he needed. Now, at the same time that this was published, where was Darwin's thinking? Um, desultory. Um, it, was, it, was, it was stuck between um, um, his experiments with seeds and, um, and salt water. Um, and, um, and he, he claimed that he'd never seen um, Dar- Dar- Wallace's um, uh, article. Um, but then years later, um, another American, uh, McKinney, um, actually found the original uh, in his study, and there were 37 different paragraphs marked with double lines down the edges, an illustration, which became the only illustration in the, uh, in the origin of species, um, turned upside down and, and developed, but still the same idea. And that was in that was as a result of reading Wallace's article. He wrote all this stuff down the margins and said, um, "Can this be believed, or is this true?" And um, uh, I, I think this is all this is all creation with him. And there was not an idea of creation in it at all, you know. But Darwin uh, needed desperately to find ways of dismissing this stuff. And um, and of course nobody ever saw this because he went straight into his um, into his uh, so-called um, desk, and, um, and nobody ever saw it for the next. Uh, I don't know, uh, 80 years probably. Wow. The, uh, now, why, why did Wallace start writing letters to Darwin? Good question. Um, Wallace, in having sent off the, um, the paper to the Natural uh, History magazine, um, then went off, uh, but because it was now 10 months later, so he was off looking for something else. And this was 1856. And what happened was that... Um, he had come up with an entirely different um, uh, paper in 1856 based on the uh, development of birds and the way that um, families of birds come from a certain species and you can recognize them by certain um, fundamental characteristics in, uh, in this particular case, he could find that the, um, the huge hornbill of Southeast Asia and the tiny um, hummingbird of the Americas um, were exactly um, from the same family. And uh, he did this by looking at the feet uh, and the bone structure of the, of the birds, the two birds, one remembering it from South America and the other one with, uh, with birds that he had shot in the, uh, in the jungles of um, Malaysia. And, um, and between the two, um, saw that the bones in the feet were exactly similar. And so he posited that, in fact, both of them were highly diverged um, elements of the same ancient species. And, um, and once he done that and sent it off, um, you know, um, he was looking for something else to do. And so he decided to go to the island of Bali. Uh, it was very difficult to, um, to get to. And anyway, he eventually got there. And when he was on Bali, it was very, um, it was very agriculturally developed, and uh, you could find no, uh, no happiness in looking for stuff there. So he went across to the island of Lombok, which is 15 miles away across um, the straits. And um, on Lombok, um, one day, he looked and he suddenly realized that none of the species on Bali um, were copied on Lombok. They were two entirely different places. They had different, almost every species was different from the islands. The birds were different, um, the insects were different, the, uh, the land animals were different. Um, and so he, he said, well, this is 
this is really interesting because it's, it shows, and he's been interested in this for years, uh, it shows that the boundaries um, that separate um, different um, species um, are distinct. He had found this in the Amazon uh, on rivers and things. And so he said, right, so I've got to tell somebody about this because um, this is very important. The only person you could think who'd ever written about this was Charles Darwin. And so um, he sent Darwin a letter, and, um, and, and that letter um, uh, arrived uh, with Darwin, and, um, uh, and he, um, he waited for a reply, and basically he sent off saying, you know, this is fascinating, and, um, uh, and I'd like you to think about this, you know, always that, and in it he would have put, of course, the work that he was doing, uh, and McKinney found this, he was, he was actually saying to Darwin, look, not only have I, you know, discovered this, but uh, my work has led me to think about this and this and this as well. And, um, and one of the things that um, he would have put in there, because it was his latest work, was, um, uh, was the whole idea of, um, of how um, species were related by what he, he termed um, descent with modification. And uh, this was that all birds descended and they changed, but the fundamentals don't change. Or all, all species change, but the fundamentals don't change. So the underlying nature of the species is always there, so you can follow it like some kind of DNA process. Anyway, um, that went off to um, Darwin, and um, and it should have arrived on February on um, January the 11th um, in 1857 at Darwin's door. And Darwin um, claimed that it didn't arrive for another four months. Right. And in that process, he put Wallace's ideas into his own material. Right. And now, this this is one of the things you researched fairly thoroughly here, is mm -hmm. the 19th century mail system and uh, how exact this was and how much of a part this plays. It, it pretty much creates a smoking gun here. Um, well... It's a smoking gun if you are prepared to admit that it's a smoking gun. Um, every Darwin supporter claims that this is not a smoking gun. Um, <laughs> that, in fact, um, there is no evidence. Uh, in fact, this whole question of the, of the letter, um, the first letter that Wallace wrote to Darwin, um, is, um, is a huge um, element in the, in the entire story simply because people say, why did um, Wallace write to him? Well, he wrote to him because of uh, these factors I just described. When it came to Darwin, um, Darwin put these things into his book um, uh, at the end of March, and 14 days later he wrote to Hooker saying, um, this is a new theory I've come up with. Um, therefore, um, establishing that he has got um, two new ideas. No idea from where. Uh, which is, I'll come on to in a second, no idea from where he got the evidence for this, um, but what he doesn't do is ever say that he got a letter from Wallace. He never admits to having got a letter from Wallace. He does reply to Wallace, but that's not quite the same thing as saying, I received a letter from Wallace in which he explained these ideas. And, um, and so on that basis alone, uh, people um, just opt out of the discussion. But nobody, nobody until now has followed that letter um, from where it started, which was on uh, um, uh, Makassar in October uh, 1856, and it arrives with Darwin um, on, on the scheduled um, shipping route in January 1857, and Darwin reckons it doesn't arrive until uh, the end of April 1857. And by that time, of course, he's written this stuff into his books as his own ideas. Now, now, how likely is it that that letter could have been delayed four months at that point? I mean, the, the mail system isn't like it is today. <laughs> you couldn't even call them the same mail systems. And this is not a mail system we got today. It's a sort of a, a luck, a lucky chance. You might, you might get your letter. You know, then, then it was so precious. The mail was currency. The mail was the most important thing in the world because nobody anywhere distant from anybody else could transmit anything at all unless it went by mail. And so the British, because they had their empire going at full pelt by this time, the British had put into, um, into being a system by which letters could leave um, uh, Singapore or Calcutta or Bombay 
um, arrive in Britain uh, within 42 days, and not only that, but know that the mail is going to be on board untampered with, because on every boat, every P&O boat that there ever was that carried mail from Singapore um, to Britain via um, Sri Lanka as it is now, um, had on board uh, an RN, a Royal Navy officer. And the Royal Navy officer's job was to make sure that on the journey the mail was not tampered with at all and that if he felt, that, because they were all men then, if he felt that in some way um, the mail um, was not going to get there on time, he could order the skipper to move. So that if the skipper was waiting for people to arrive at some place, he would say, no, this is not going to be on schedule. You know, you go now or you leave those people behind. And he had the ultimate authority on getting the mail to Britain and then to the post office in Britain um, without tampering. They were all in sealed boxes, in closed boxes, locked um, for the journey. And it was his job to make sure he got that on time. And, and that's what happened. And, um, and we've got evidence um, of, of um, documents in the archives of, um, of exactly this happening, when they arrived from the day to the, to the hour and the minute um, of people claiming, filling in forms saying it arrived here on, eight, on the 8th at 12.22 uh, p.m. and left again on the, on the 8th at 15.63 p.m. Or, or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, as it would have been then. And, and, um, and the, for the people who say, look, there's no smoking, there's no, there's no smoking gun here. Um, the mail system itself is a smoking gun. It just could not be tampered with. And, and yet you'll find, as I found um, with one fellow in uh, Singapore and another one in America, that in fact they will go to any lengths to try to um, make the mail system look as if it could be tampered with easily uh, so that Darwin never received these letters on the days that they were supposed to be there. It's just totally untrue. It's just that people I, I complained about one person throwing sand in people's eyes because he throws up so many objections to what could have happened to the mail without taking into account that the mail was probably as secure as, um, as Fort Knox would have been for most of the people trying to get gold out of it. You know, I mean, they couldn't get at it. It, it was not possible. And when, and when uh, there were delays, um, the mail that came was the second delivery of, of the month, so that they picked up another delivery and brought it with, um, with, the next, um, with the next boat. And that, too, had been guarded all the time by somebody on board. It's, um, right. it's a terrific story of organization, particularly British at that time, um, in, inevitably. But, I mean, um, you know, they were running half the bloody world, and, you know, it, uh, it got to a crunch where, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't take chances. I mean, they, they had the Indian mutiny in 1857 was happening. Right? This is exactly the same time as Wallace is sending his letter to Darwin. Now, the soldiers and the, um, and the sailors and the government officials all needed to get their dispatches back to London so that London would understand what was happening. And it took six weeks to get there. They wouldn't allow any letters to go missing in, in such a situation. We were in Hong Kong. We were in trouble in, in China because, um, you know, we were there and the Chinese were trying to pick off the, um, the naval detachments. And um, so they, they had all these trouble spots on exactly the same line as Wallace's letters were going back to Darwin. So it's very unlikely that, um, that any of this um, sort of... Uh, uh, dispute, if you like, about uh, whether mail was safe or not. You know, I, I just, I, I just find it very hard to believe people who offer um, that as an excuse. It's, it's not possible. And, and to be, be clear to anyone who doesn't have this in context, mm. there was no radio, <laughs> there was no other means of communication other than the mail. There was nothing. Well, unless somebody wanted to swim. There was nothing, you know, and basically, basically, it's almost an impossible concept to take on board these days, right? You, you're yeah. calling me from New York, right, or, or wherever, and, um, yeah. and I'm, I'm responding, and, and you can hear me and I can hear you. That would have taken three months yeah. in 1857. And, I, and you would have to wait three months for me to tell you what it, what it was coming back the other way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and probably we wouldn't we wouldn't have radio to put a note on anyway. So I mean it's it's a it's a ridiculous concept. And yet you still get people saying, oh well, you know, it's not a smoking gun because it might have done this and it might have done that. Um, anyway, there's a there's a better example later on in the conversation, I suppose. Um, you know, but that's that's why he wrote the letter to Darwin in the first place. 
and okay. offered him all the ideas that Darwin then took. Yeah. And, and he actually wrote Darwin three different letters, and two of them Darwin claims were delayed. Yes. The, the second one was written um, uh, later in 1857 um, and derived, arrived in Darwin's home in December, and Darwin replied immediately um, uh, with the news for Wallace that, in fact, um, Lyle had... Um, had recommended uh, da uh, Wallace's paper to Darwin, and um, and Darwin felt that um, uh, that uh, Wallace should know this, um, and of course that was an important part of the story too. But that that letter alone uh, came. Uh, Darwin arrived on time because particularly because Darwin had asked Wallace for information, and so Wallace's letter came, and Darwin needed the information on um, uh, panthers or, or black jaguars, a countryman which he was on a desert island. And Wallace had sent him back information. So in that case, Darwin had to admit that the letter had arrived. And it was the letter he wrote back um, that informed uh, Wallace that uh, Lyle was interested in his ideas. Well, what, what was Wallace working on that led to the third letter? Okay. Um, <clears throat> after, after discovering the, uh, the Wallace line, as it's now known, um, Wallace uh, had decided that he wanted to go to the Spice Islands. Um, he had never been there, and um, uh, he felt that uh, one way easily of getting there is to take the um, what he called a government boat, which was um, an official boat set up to go around all the islands, um, uh, carrying passengers, not many, but passengers, and um, delivering mail and um, artifacts and goods to the various people on the islands. It was a, a monthly um, round turn uh, for any boat that was on that line at that particular time. And uh, so Wallace jumped on board um, in, um, in Makassar in November uh, 1857 and went to the Spice Islands and got off at an island called Ternate, and, um, uh, which is a very famous island uh, going way back into the 16th century. Um, and there, um, one day on the a neighboring island of Jillalo, he, um, he was looking and measuring and looking at the people and working out um, about them when he had um, a most um, nasty bout of um, malaria. And uh, while he was in this malaria state, he suddenly realized that the piece that he'd been missing um, was about why species changed. What was it about the world uh, that they lived in that caused a new species to develop? And uh, he recalled, while he was in this malarial state, um, uh, the teachings of Malthus um, in, in the late 18th century, um, that in fact, in any society, um, the population is affected by two things. One is um, the need for food, and two, the ability to produce enough food to eat. Um, the production of food is arithmetic, and the uh, consumption of food is geometric. The population grows geometrically, um, but the, the ability to produce food only, um, uh, only develops arithmetically, which means, of course, that uh, food is always outstripping, uh, the need for food is always outstripping its supply. That means that in any situation where that applies, that those, the, those um, individuals um, able and strong enough to get the food will survive, and the people who are not strong enough to get the food will wither away and die, they become extinct. So if there are any varieties of the species um, in uh, that context, then the variety that will survive will take its, uh, will take its characteristics, as it were, um, and um, in a sexual context, um, develop um, along the same lines as that particular variety, whereas a different variety that wasn't able to find a way of getting food would have become extinct and therefore was not around any longer um, to offer its own characteristics to the gene pool, which, which meant really that, um, that the coloration, the size, um, the, um, the, the sheer uh, um, what can I call it, the sheer somethingness of that particular variety would become a new species because it had difference, differences from all the other species that had been, um, that had been eliminated uh, by unable, unable to get uh, enough food. So 
he suddenly realized all this while he was ill, and, and he knew now why varieties became species, and therefore he knew why new species arrived in the world. And so while he was still ill, and uh, over the next few days, uh, he wrote this out um, on what he calls uh, thin postal paper, and, um, and got away from Jilolo back to Tangate to get it onto the boat which was calling there on March the 9th in 1858 and on board he had finished a letter to his to the brother of his friend Bates and that went on with his letter to uh, Darwin and uh, uh, that those two letters left on the same boat on March the 9th in 1858 from Ternate, uh on the rest of the round trip to get back to uh, Batavia which is um, uh, which is on Java and from there to Singapore from Singapore back to England Sorry, it's a bit long-winded, but I mean... Uh, That's all right. And and now these two letters yeah. should have arrived to both people, both Darwin and Bates. Was it Bates? Uh, Bates' brother, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they should have arrived at the same time then. Uh, yes, and if what I've said about the postal service uh, rings true, there's no way that they could have been interrupted on that journey. And uh, and so this is the dilemma for people. You know, um, the first letter to Bates' brother... Um, uh, was postmarked um, Singapore, April 21. It was postmarked Southampton. Um, no, it, it wasn't postmarked Southampton, sorry. It was postmarked London uh, at 6 p.m. on June the 2nd um, and would have been delivered to uh, Bates on, uh, on June the 3rd, as it was, and he lived in Leicester, which is about 120 miles or so north of London. Um, Darwin's letter, which would have come by exactly the same post, um, uh, never arrived. At least according to Darwin. Unfortunately, according to Darwin, yes, it never arrived. And none of these, he didn't keep any of this, these letters as evidence, uh, so we don't have well, postmarks. Let me, let me go back a little. When I say it never arrived, what, what, we don't know what arrived, but, uh, but Wallace's letter to Darwin um, was hastily, um, uh, hastily, as far as Darwin's concerned, sent on to uh, Lyle, and Lyle and Hooker between them uh, read it and responded to Darwin. Um, and Darwin, uh, somehow, um, the letter disappeared. We don't know how, but it's never been seen since. Nor has Wallace's theory, um, which he sent over with the letter. Um, and so, basically, we, we are left with, um, with only Darwin's account of what happened. And he reckons that he received it on the 18th of June, not the 2nd of June or the 3rd of June, but he received it on the 18th of June and, um, and as a result told Lyle that all his work would be undone. And he left it to Lyle and Hooker to come up with a scheme between them to save his bacon, as it were. Yeah. Now, do you think Lyle and Hooker were complicit in, in like knowing what was going on, or were they just trying to help out a friend? Yeah, um, this is, um, this is a difficult one. I, I, I admire Hooker, um, um, and I admire N Lyle because of his honesty. I, I think what happened here is that the conspiracy um, was um, to bring Darwin the prize, and, and not necessarily to diminish um, Wallace, but to make him the second person, the second important person in, in this. So what they did was to say to Darwin, uh, okay, look, um, you've got your theory of uh, 1840, which you, uh, 1844, which you've um, still got, and you've got your letter from Asa Gray, which you copied, uh, luckily, um, and, and kept. Um, I don't know how, to what extent that was, uh, uh, that was important. I'll come back to that if you want to. And, um, and he said, between the two, you were able to say that you have these ideas um, a long time before you heard of them from Wallace. And that's exactly what the conspiracy was um, in an attempt to get away from Wallace the prize for being the original f discoverer of the theory of evolution. And when he's written other people about this, it seemed that his ideas were very unformed and unfinished, and he didn't really elaborate. No, he didn't. He couldn't. I mean, he didn't know. Um, he, see, Wallace... Wallace had put into his uh, letter, obviously, the influence of um, um, the influence of. Uh, sorry, I've gone for his name. Malthus, the influence of Malthus on his ideas when he was having this fit in uh, in Gillilo. Um 
And therefore, Malthus turns up inside his explanation for how this happened. Wallace, uh, Darwin had read Malthus, but dismissed him um, at a very early stage. And, um, and yet, suddenly, he uses and says um, to everybody, look, um, you know, um, I also use Malthus um, in my theory of 1844. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't make Malthus important in his theory of 1844, um, and and um, that was untrue. And both men, if they had read his theory, knew it. But only only Hooker had ever read Darwin's theory of 1844, and he dismissed it um, with words of faint praise because um, he wasn't convinced by it then. And so, so basically, the whole situation came down to, um, dear Lyle, dear Hooker. Can you help me here? I'm in desperate trouble. Um, I'm going to lose my priority um, to this man Wallace um, if we don't find a way of solving this because he's written me this letter. And, um, and so they did. They found a way of getting the meeting organized on July the 1st, 1858, at the Linnaean Society in London. Um, and the room was packed with, of course, inevitably, all their friends, because um, these were the people that they, the scientific community of London at that time. And of course, Wallace was only a, um, a, a collector, you know, he was a workman, uh, and Darwin was one of theirs. So what Hooker and Lyle did was to outline Darwin's own claim um, to vie with that of Wallace. Um, and uh, as a result, um, the Tenate uh, theory uh, still exists. Um, because it was published um, in the journal of the Linnaean Society, um, but the letter since has disappeared. But the, the, at least we know what Wallace said in his uh, account of the theory, and um, we've never had and never will see any account that uh, Darwin put up um, in terms of um, uh, going against that, because it was left to Lyle and Hooker to make the case for Darwin when he, he wasn't there at the, at the Linnaean when they met. And so the members voted through the fact that Darwin should be the person who got the credit as the first person, and, uh, and Wallace's name could be conjoined with it as the second person. So therefore, it became the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution for a long time. And then suddenly, when, uh, when Darwin died, um, it became the, um, uh, after Wallace's death, it became the Darwin theory of evolution. And that's how people remember it to this day. Right, right. And the, the the thing about the timing of the letters is Darwin seemed to get these massive insights right after he should have received Wallace's letters, but claimed they showed up after he had his insights. And those insights were very similar to what Wallace was writing him about. This is the this is the bit which um which I'm really angry at academics uh, for not picking up. Um my book is not about um accident or um, doubt, you know, we know what Wallace said, we know when he said it, and we know the letters in which he included it. And, um, and Darwin was never before Wallace in terms of these ideas. It was always Wallace getting his ideas back to England, either to Darwin or to the magazine, um, and then being published. And, um, and then these ideas being secretly put into Darwin's own letters and, um, and his journals so that he could claim um, that he had these informations, um, you know, at a certain time. Well, you know, I mean, with, with two uh, letters disappearing inside out of three letters over a period of 18 months, I mean, you know, in a, in a system that the English had put in, into place to, um, to get mail back um, is just not very helpful to academics arguing that Darwin is the man. Because simply because they can show that Wallace had all these ideas uh, before they turned up in, in Darwin's writings. If I'm right and the letters arrived uh, when I say they did and not when Darwin says they did. Right, right. All right, you're on WVBR FM Ithaca, and we're talking here with Roy Davies for a little bit longer as we uh, complete this discussion on his book, The Darwin Conspiracy. And... Uh, one of the things you talk about is, is uh, Brooks tracing some of these matters and finding insertions into some of Darwin's older texts. Yeah, uh, John Brooks, a, a lovely guy. I, I, um, he helped me before he died um, when I was first thinking of this. And um, John um, 
John also um, had a bad time because he was going against Darwin, um, and he told me, he said, look, Roy, he said, it's a hard sell, and they won't want you to put it out. They will come and try to knock you off. He said, I don't, I don't mean that literally, but I mean, uh, you know, it can be wasted anyway, but I mean, they, they will try to upset your ideas. And that's happened too. However, John, um, in 84, was it 84? Oh, perhaps before then, I can't remember. Um, John uh, had the idea that um, he wanted to see a version of uh, Darwin's um, manuscript book um, in which he, in his diary. And, um, and there was a man in America who had this, and he went to see him. And, um, and John said, can I, can I see you the pages where uh, Darwin received Wallace's letter around that time? And he said yes. He showed him. And what, Darwin, uh, what, Wallace, uh, what, sorry, what John Brooks realized was that the, the, the paper that Darwin had been using um, in the months leading up to receiving Wallace's letter um, was a certain sort of paper. And then next to it, just after receiving Wallace's letter, were 40, 45 pages of um, on an entirely different sort of paper. Um, talking about the very subject that, Darwin, that Wallace had been discussing uh, when he sent it, the whole idea of um, divergence, um, diverging from one species into another. And, um, and this whole idea was unknown um, to Darwin. He just had never written about this before in any real sense. In any, and now there were 45 pages on different paper exactly at the point when Wallace's letter would have reached him. And it was those 45 pages which gave Brooks the idea, and he said, they're about divergence, I know they are, and they were. And, uh, and what he was really saying was, look, the only person who understood divergence completely at that time in the world was Wallace. And Darwin, yeah. after getting Wallace's letter, had, had used these 45 pages to put into his own version of uh, what he called divergence, what Wallace had been calling for a long time, uh, descent with modification. But it's the same process, the idea that as things change, and move away from each other, they change and become a different sort of uh, coloration and size, etc. And, and Darwin then put that in, and then used another um, 25 pages um, on an entirely different aspect of, um, uh, of divergence in a, in a slightly different place in the diary. And that too was on the same color paper that he'd used um, uh, to record what uh, Wallace had given him in the first instance. So basically, John Brooks found 66 new pages of divergence written into Wallace's, into Darwin's diary at the very time that he would have received Wallace's letter. And divergence um, had been nothing in his work until then um, in terms of explaining how. All, all Darwin was prepared to say was that I do remember um, when I first came across the idea of a divergence, it was when I was sitting in my carriage along the road, and I remember the exact spot on the road where it occurred to me. What occurred to him? No idea. No idea at all. He never explained. No, nothing, well, what, what, he could, what could he explain? His, his work was not in the same, either the same dimension or, or, the, or, the, or the same intensity as uh, Wallace's discoveries in the wild. It just, it just wasn't, it wasn't comparable. So, now, why does, why does everyone connect the theory of evolution to his trip to the the uh, to the islands there? To Galapagos? Yeah. You you mean Wallace's or, or Darwin's? No, Darwin's. Why? Why? Because whenever you talk about Darwin, people know about the trip on the Beagle. Yeah, to the that, to the Galapagos. Yeah, and that doesn't seem to have had anything to do with it. Well, it didn't. I mean, except that. Um, <laughs> Darwin went there in, um, I think he got there in 1830, 1835, November 1835, he got to Galapagos on the, on the Beagle. And, um, and what he saw there, um, the lizards, etc., were very interesting, and the, um, uh, and the tortoises were very interesting. But um, what, uh, what he couldn't make of them was why they differed on every different island. He couldn't, um, he couldn't explain that. He didn't even think of it, actually. I mean, let's get it straight. Nothing, con nothing consumed Darwin about um, uh, how things were as they were on the Galapagos. He was interested that they were there at all and fascinated by the, the kind of strangeness he saw. But in terms of why they were um, different, 
In fact, it was the um, deputy governor of the Galapagos Islands who told Darwin that um, species by species, uh, the, the tortoises on the islands were different from each other. And he could tell which island this, this particular tortoise came from by, by the shape of its shell or by, the, by a difference in its coloration or whatever. And Darwin didn't understand that at all. And it was only 10 years later um, when he first decided to put his thoughts on evolution together that Darwin introduced the idea of the Galapagos being an instance of where you could see evolution in being. Ten years later, he had not referred it to it at all um, in his writings until that time. And of course, um, this was the essay that he gave to Hooker uh, to read in 1846. And Hooker um, said, no, uh, Charles, it's, it's all right, but it's not going to set the place alight. You know? And at that point, Darwin put it under the stairs and wrapped it up and told his wife to um, edit, to give it to an editor and publish after his death. But I mean, um, this was the essay that um, that he used to say that he knew all this stuff against um, Wallace when it came to the Linnaean meeting in 1858. And and when when I when I've read as I've read this book, the picture I get is. Darwin was someone who was trying so hard to to get ahead, to make his mark, and to sort of, uh, you know, really be something. And he had Wallace, who was kind of just there. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't really making an effort. It just these things were just occurring to him. And it, it seems like you're watching Darwin take little bits and pieces and try to fit them together like a puzzle. And when he gets Wallace's pieces, he slams them together and, and realizes what he has, and then tries to kind of obscure where everything came from and act like it was his own. And that's true. That, that's pretty well exactly what happened. I mean, he would only change his process of thinking once Wallace's ideas came across and suggested that what he was doing was leading the debate. At that time, Wally, uh, Darwin would then change his ideas slightly so that um, he would drop seeds in salt water and go looking at pigeons and to find out um, what pigeons, how pigeons develop and how pigeons um, change from one shape to another according to breeders. Um, and then, um, what was the, the next thing? There, there was something else that he, he went looking for um, because that might solve this other particular thing. And, and, and quite honestly, it was always in response to Wallace's simple and, and yet profound analysis of what he was finding in the, uh, in the jungles. It was, it was it's a remarkable story, Wallace's story. And it's all to do with a trained eye that he trained as a surveyor, of course, a trained eye in seeing landscapes boundaries, um, societies of birds, societies of monkeys, um, using them and seeing them in an entirely different way than anybody had ever seen them before. And it was this ability that he had to recognize, to understand, um, to experiment, um, to decide to write and to illustrate. I mean, all of this stuff, you know, can't be faulted. I mean, it, it, it is the work of, of a genius working alone in the most some of the most terrifying situations that um, a, a human being can put themselves in year by year, day by day, um, with little rest and, and ignoring yellow fever and, and dis, you know, distempers and, and illnesses and bites and, 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 and nasty bits of business in swamps and things, and just so that he can get at these elements so that he can find the pattern which we now know to be evolution. He just worked at it. And he was inspired, and and the man had abilities which we've rarely seen since. And um, and it wasn't only in the fields of natural history. You, you know, he, he was he was a humanist. I mean, you know, the, this man upset us. You know, because basically when he came back, people said, "Oh, Wallace, 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 Wallace. Wallace is into um, head reading, and Wallace is into bump reading, and Wallace is into um, words beyond the grave, and all sorts of things." And basically, Wallace was an untaught unformed genius. He would look at anything because he'd never been taught that you can't look at anything. Do you see what I mean? Right. I mean, if you go to an academic yeah. discussion today, people say, well, if this is important, the rest isn't important. Whereas Wallace was, was seeing everything as important. And um, because he was seeing everything as important, of course, he was able to eliminate himself all the things that weren't important. And he was left with the elements which gave him the theory of evolution. He's a, just, a, just an absolutely remarkable man. And, and one of the things I had heard of why Wallace was removed from the paper was that he was researching things like spiritualism and such, and the scientific community frowned upon it. 
Well, they would, of course, um, because, as I say, he, he, as far as he was concerned, there was an interesting phenomenon. Uh, you know, I mean, what was to stop him looking at it? You know, he looked at yeah. everything else. He looked at the way, <laughs> way people. He looked at the way um, um, the Christians went to outward back, outback places and caused havoc among the natives. You know, he looked at that. You know, and he wrote about it. He said, "Look, why is land owned?" Um, uh, by other people, why can't land? Why can't land be free so that we can all enjoy it? I mean, you know, this man was a socialist before his time. He was, and in this country, of course, I mean, you know, there's a huge debate between socialism and conservatism. But, but Wallace was a true socialist. As far as he was concerned, there should be no boundaries. And yet, is, uh, the irony is that he was seeing boundaries among animals, which allowed him to say, "Look, if they leave that and go to there, it's because they've changed from that to this." And, uh, and, and because of that, his theory, you know, it just was so simple and laid out so simply, even while he was ill, you know, and if you read it, it's, it reads as if somebody sat down and altered words and it was only the first draft and, he, and yet it reads as if it's, um, it's been done for Encyclopedia de Britannica or something. You know? <laughs> All right. Well, we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. I want to get real quick. Uh, why do you think there's such a knee-jerk response to material like this? Why, why can't the establishment types look at this information and say, well, maybe Darwin didn't come up with the stuff the way he said he did? Interesting, isn't it? It throws, um, it throws a question back at people who claim that they're scientists. If, if you're a scientist, I would have imagined that, um, that you analyze the evidence and come to a conclusion. I mean, I'm not a yeah. scientist, but it seems to me that that is an obvious way of proceeding. Well, very, very, very few, and I probably say on two fingers actually, um, very few people have actually gone to the evidence in the book. That, that is their own evidence. It's own, you know, these, are, these are academics and, and people who know and, and say to me, look, you're wrong to say that because, or you're wrong to say this because. And it seems to me that nobody wants, even now, to be the person who pulls Darwin off his chair. I mean, it's, it's, it's a remarkable thing, and we're in the 21st century, and yet here we are actually paying homage to a man who, as far as I'm concerned, cheated, you know, an ordinary working class man out of his rightful inheritance as the person who discovered evolution. Today in this country, you know, Wallace is now slightly more known than he was uh, before I wrote the book and before the anniversary. Um, but, um, you know, nowhere near the kind of um, response. Charles Darwin was the person voted um, the most important person in the history of British, I don't know, whatever. Uh, right, uh, you know, right. this was about four years ago, six years ago. And, um, and here we go, Wallace, who really is the archetype of, of what it takes to be a scientist, um, actually only now coming to people's uh, recognition. It's, a, it's an awful story, uh, but, but everybody's dead, right? So um, I think I'm the only person left alive who's still writing uh, this sort of stuff about Wallace. Well, you know, okay, I don't mind that, but I mean, you know, um, you'd think that some scientist or other, some Darwinist or other, would actually want to say, okay, let me, let me check what this fellow's saying here. Because it's all reference. I mean, everything in the book has got an academic reference to it. You know, the, the, there is no, this is not um, conspiracy theory, right? This is an actual conspiracy uh, between academics who refuse to go looking um, at things that they should have known about years ago, and they must have known it existed, and they, they didn't. And in fact, I mean, um, uh, uh, Gruber says this, you know, this shouldn't, I should not have discovered this as a psychoanalyst. You know, this should have been well known among the scientific elite um, years ago. And he says that, right. and this is written what, 30, 40 years ago. And so basically we're left with um, a situation where the academics who could do something about this, I could name names, I don't want to because that would be invidious, but they all know who they are. They, 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 they say, well, I don't agree, or it doesn't go far enough for me, or, um, well, it's a bit fishy, but let's leave it like that. And, um, uh, well, yes, that letter didn't arrive for four months is interesting. Um, but the question is, did Darwin then use those ideas? Oh, well, um, let's not go into that, you know, because, because they yeah. seem not to want to. And so we end up in a situation where, you know, I, I, I have lost respect for most Darwin scholars, um, and, um, and quite honestly, I mean, I don't think that they've ever respected me either, but I mean, that's, that's quits, you know, that's, that's fair. And, and, and it seems like Wallace 
never really realized he was duped out of his theory. He seemed to respect Darwin and, and seemed to believe that they both came up with the theory around the same time. You're absolutely right. He, he didn't know. He never knew. It was only towards the end of his life that he had an inkling that um, things might not have been as they were stated. But quite honestly, nobody ever said, nobody ever, nobody ever told him. And in fact, of course, there were only three people who knew. That was Wall that yeah. was Darwin and uh, Lyle and Hooker, and um, and they did the job at the Linnaean and got Darwin his proper rights. But I mean, quite honestly, nobody else knew. And now it's 150 years later, and, and um, is it 150 years later? I can't work it out. Or perhaps it's only, yes, it is 150 years later. And, and now nobody cares. You know, I care because I'd love to see Wallace get his proper position, and I don't care for Darwin. You know, I mean, um, you can see by the way his theory changed after getting Wallace's ideas that, in fact, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot about this man you could admire. You know, people admired him yeah. because he thought the theory of evolution. He didn't. It was Wallace's ideas, and Darwin stole them. All right. Well, uh, the, the unfortunate part about your book is it is no longer in print. It's no longer in print, but um, there are copies available if people want them, but not through Amazon. You know, um, I'm not going through yeah, Amazon. If, they can just if you, if, if you go to the American Amazon, they're almost a hundred dollars a piece. That's, un, that's unfair, that. and it's it's obscene. If I had a way of um, of getting this out on ebook into um, into the ether, I'd put it there. That isn't the problem, but I don't have that. Um, I don't have that access anymore. Um, if people, if people want to write to me at uh, Troy Davis at um, AOL dot com, um, you know, uh, we can make arrangements to send them a book. But I mean, um, it's a, it's a slow pace. We're doing it that way, but at least it comes cheaper. Yes, yes, and and well, you, they just pay the cover price of the book. You know, this is not, and there are hardbacks and softbacks. But I mean. Um, Maybe, uh, maybe nobody wants to. In which case, uh, that's fine. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll build a bench out of them and write my next book on the top of the bench. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend people get in touch with you to get a book. I thoroughly enjoyed this book, not just because of the factual information, but the way you wrote it. It reads very, uh, very much like a story. Like you're, you're just reading about these characters as they live their lives and as these things fall into pieces. And I mean. The fact that it's all real just makes it that more interest, that much more interesting. Well, but it's very well written and very entertaining to read. On top of the fact that it's also a little, it made me a little bit angry, you know. I, I mean, it should have been. Uh, that uh, was my in original intention, but I realized at the end that um, I, 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 I had allowed people um, to think that, in fact, some injustice has been done here. All right, and I thank you, Roy, uh, for a fascinating conversation. And uh, we're running a little bit long. I'm going to take you out with Psyche Corporation. This is Worrying World.